my pinch just got more and more lumpy, more and more pinchy. So when you add structure, the pinch becomes more pinch. It takes care of itself. Because the pinch is more about the structure. It's more about each isolated form. So as you render each isolated form, you naturally get the pinch. So I'm going to consider pinch a structural uh, problem, or at least something that gets solved just by doing the structure. I don't even have to worry about it. Stretch is how I unify it. If I start thinking about all the separate shapes, all the separate structure on the stretch, look what happens. It's it less stretchy. It gets more lumpy, less unified, less graceful. We start getting potholes in our, our road. So in the stretch, I've got to be very conscious of it because if I add the wrong detail or don't think of how lots of things work together, I just think about the things themselves. I've lost my principal power of my art form. How to let the audience see how it all works together. So the one that's right, you know, movements. That's right. And then there'll be how much you unify on this, how much you separate on that is going to depend. Rubens would separate lots of forms on both sides, but there'd still be more lumps over here and less lumps over there. Aang would simplify them both. There'd be almost no change here as you moved over a hip bone or something. And there'd be a minimal change here, but there would still be the same relative complexity and lumpiness on this side to this side when you do Rubens or A. So go look at Rubens' work and see if you can't find the relative, and it's all relative, the relative unifying principle of the stretch side and the relative separating lumpy complexity of the pin side. And then go look at A. You see if you can't see the same thing. Radically different aesthetics. One's a minimalist in terms of realism. And one's uh, real style. And everything from all. So stretch and pinch. So that takes care of pinch. We don't have to even think of that as a gesture. What about twist? Well, a twist is always characterized by an S-curve. One of the ways we can call the stretch is a bulging line. And we could call the pinch a binding line. It might be just a slightly uh, concave tube, or it might be a real lumpy series of A's. But the bulge in the bind, the convex and the concave, here's a convex line, and here's a concave line. A twist can actually be thought of as a stretch and an opposing stretch. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get the head stretching off to the left, and you're going to get the rib cage stretching off to the right, and they're both going in different directions. That's what a twist does. That's called contrapposto, opposing positions. So actually, we're going to think contrary positions is uh, translation. <clears throat> so think of a twist as two stretches put together. It's just a stretch going this way and a stretch going that way. And the, the easiest way to think of it is rope. The fiber starts on this side and ends up on that side. Or the rib cage starts on this side and the pelvis ends up on this side. And when you connect the center of the pelvis to the center of the rib cage, you get an S curve. Two opposing stretches. That's what we want to use as a twist. So the twist is not a brand new gesture at all. It's just the same old stretch, just uh, mixed and matched. If you, the other way to think of this is that instead of this two opposing stretches, you can think of it as a stretch, a left facing stretch, and a left facing pinch, too. And that'll explain any other S curve. Because if I look at a, a contour, you're going to see a rise and a fall. Bulging, binding. 
convex, concave. And so as we move down whatever form, this will bulge out away from it and this will bind back in. Okay, so in fact, that's the design of the whole body. If we look at a profile, here is Stretch, pitch, stretch, pitch, stretch, pitch. Those are all of our stretches. down from one structure to the next, stretch will become a pitch. Now sometimes we get several structures grouping on one stretch, sometimes we get several structures grouping on one pitch, sometimes it will just be one structure, and we're going to define our structures or our parts from joint to joint. So we'll pass from one joint to the other, either reinforcing the stretch or becoming the pitch. Or, if we decide to do it as opposing stretches, stretch, stretch. Stretch, 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 stretch. Go to the back side of a, of a pinch, and you got a stretch. Go to the front side of a stretch, and you got a pinch. So it's just how you want to plan. But since I want to keep in mind in my art that life is water, that life is a wave. Sounds like I'm going to write a poem. Life is a wave. go inside, you'll see Gumby's wire do this. Go like that. That's what we're after. It doesn't matter what the shape is. It's an egg. It's a box. It's two-dimensional. It's three-dimensional. It starts out as a box, ends up with an egg. It's a uh, tube on one side and a box on the other. I don't know. We've come up with six or eight different ways to do the whip cage. None of it really matters. What matters is that it flows correctly into the belly and the hips. That it's a rhythm that plays correctly off the opposing rhythm. And notice what happens when we do our stretch. The next stretch is either lower or higher than the previous stretch. Now, if we have nothing else, it ends. But stretch, and then we must have a stretch that's not right across. It has to be lower or higher. If you get your stretches right across, you get muscle bound. But his muscle bound can't move very well because this lump gets in the way of the other lump. And you can't, you can't do much with it. So if this is a high stretch, the next one will be a low stretch or vice versa. And that way, we get this piston action. One area relaxes, the other fights gravity. And then that fights gravity relaxes and you get the, the working of the muscle in this movement, this dynamic leverage movement, but also it keeps that water in its eye. So it's functional. Now since we've got a watery figure, we're designing the figure off the wave action. It's designed off the wave action for one other reason, and that's because we're self-contained mobile units. We can get around. So that means if I'm going to be designed on a curve, and we are designed on a curve, and I'm not going to curve over and fall down, then every time I curve back one way, I've got to curve back the other. And so what you'll see is 
the forms go one way and then another series of forms will go the other and it becomes a balancing act. Look at what happens. All those ways will balance out. You can have a little bit of out of balance, but not very much. If you start to lose it, you fall over. And so since we're self-contained creatures, and since we're designed on that watery curve, the wave is the only way you can balance it out. It's not only water, but it's balance. So if it goes this way, we need something over here to balance it. One way or the other. Several ways that can happen that we'll get into. But that's what we'll see. Look what happens if I want to explode, if I want to not be stable, but I want to move, have all this potential energy that I use. What do I do? I coil up my watery S curves, and what happens to them? They become a zigzag, a spring, and now I can move explosively. So you take that watery life and you compress it in tension, then it becomes this coil, this potential energy that can explode. What am I going to do if I'm going to punch you in the old cartoon punch? You coil it up and you fall. Like that. What's a dog or leg or a cat? Look at their back leg. And you'll see it's built like this. And their front leg, so it's going off that old S curve. The front leg only does about a third or a fourth of the locomotion. It's mainly for steering. If you watch the uh, those predators of life, where the little bunnies get torn to shreds. <laughs> If you watch the predators chase, the cheetah will do this as it's chasing that gazelle, steering here, and it's got a rudder back here, but all the motion is this spring. Two thirds of it is, is back here. So they're faster than us, they're more coiled to sprint. But what does the Olympic runners do on the sprint? They get down in the blocks like this, so they can get a quick motion. So you take that relaxed, watery flow. And the storm brews, what happens to the waves? They start to crest and break, and that's what we're getting. We're getting that tension. So the S curve and the zigzag are actually the same idea, the same watery design. One is life and tension, the other is life and relaxation. So let's stop there for our next set, and then I'll give you that uh, little art history lesson. Okay, so we're after that watery wave action. And when we look at the twist, we'll see it as an S curve. And when we want to look at any watery design, we'll see it as an S curve. What we're looking for is the stretch to the stretch, and that'll tell us how to fit separate forms into one unifying design. And if those separate forms are facing in separate directions, then the S curve is moving us from left to right kind of like. If they're just wide forms, period, then they're just they're going to all be facing as they want to face, but we'll still get that line. So it really doesn't matter whether it's a twist or whether it's just a living form in a regular position. It's going to be designed off water, off that flow, the wave action. The stretch into the pinch or the stretch into the opposing stretch. And if you'll look at the spine, if you'll build the head and the rib cage and pelvis off the spine, you'll see that water is designed right there for you. This is the stretch of the fist. And this is the stretch of the rib cage. This is the stretch of the belly. This is the stretch of the hips. And you'll see it right there. The three most difficult, most important forms, their designs right in the spine. Maybe they all start to move into the same rhythm. Or maybe they all separate into different rhythms. It just depends on how it articulates, but you'll see it through the spine. So that's what we want to try and get. Whenever we get opposing positions, that's called contrapositive, contrary positions. And technically, any opposition of position is contrapositive. And so your body is built on that. Why do you twist this way? This is the way we usually think of it. But actually, it's all uh, in opposing positions. <laughs> Like 
from that, what you just sent in and your first or what you are naming on the mm -hmm. Okay, the Contra Pasta concept. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was well, the, the don't mistake concept. We're just talking about, if we talk about contrapasto, it's just opposing positions. How you get the position is how you get a position. The gesture is off the center. So we're using the gesture as the design line, and that's going to help us find it. Sure. But if I stand here like this, my rib cage is a little bit above you. It's tilting this way. And my pelvis is a little bit below you. Opposing positions. If I did this, my rib cage is leaning off axis and my pelvis is staying on axis. Possible. If I did this, my rib cage is facing to my right, my pelvis is facing more forward. Opposing positions. They're all opposing positions. You have three dimensions. So you have three positions in space. How it faces, how it leans, and how it tips. All of those are. Usually we take these others for granted. And we talk about this when we talk about Hunter Pasta. But it'll, it's really any of them. And you can see then that the body is built on opposing curves. Because there's an S curve built into the spine. The rib cage tilts forward, the pelvis tilts back. The rib cage tilts forward, the pelvis tilts back. Now, if that rib cage also slightly torques, Getting a little bit of the front of the ribs, or get a little bit of the back of the hips, then we'll get also a, a twisting that one. If the rib cage falls towards us and the pelvis falls away, we'll also get a dynamic back. So it's all three dimensions. Now, on the um, in terms of those. Dimensions, if you follow art history, you'll see them all develop separately. You start out with sculpture, we'll just talk about sculpture, as a really a two-dimensional design. What I mean by that is that early sculpture, you can get sculpted chest, sculpted belly, sculpted cheekbone, but the positions of them were flat, in fact, one-dimensional, what we call it. And the, the earliest so if we start with Greeks, the early Greek sculpture, what do you have? You had bas reliefs and then you had some sculpture too. But if you think of the bas reliefs, you'll get the Egyptian pharaoh and he's standing like this, always a profile. Why did they do the profile? Because the profile is the most descriptive silhouette of a face. Nose pushes out, lips push out, chin goes back to the connecting neck. If you think of a head, its most characteristic view, if you're just going to do a silhouette, would be the profile. But what do they do to the eye? The most characteristic view of the eye is the almond shape of the eye. So they gave us a front view of the eye. And then you came down to the profile here, and how about the arms and shoulders? You got a front view of the arms and shoulders, but you got a side of the hip and the leg and the foot. So the most characteristic view. If you ask a little child to draw a hand, will they do this? They'll do that, won't they? That's the most characteristic view. They'll do the turkey. Because it's more characteristic. So a pr more primitive understanding of form, you're going to visualize the form in the most characteristic view you can. The silhouette, the edge that is most descriptive. That's called touch sight. Touch sight is how far away before I bump into something. How far away before I touch the cold water, before I take a step, before I hit the mat truck. That's how you survive in life, is knowing exactly how far away before you touch the edge of things. So as a human being surviving in the world, from the earliest age, you're taught to think in edges. The little mobile of the baby's crib, what's that do? It teaches them that they're separate from the world, that they have to reach up a certain amount before they touch. So when a little baby learns to walk, it's getting these things to work right. It's also knowing how far below is the ground, how far away is the coffee table. 
making those spatial decisions, learning to separate you, and the way you do it most efficiently is from edge to edge. So we spend our whole waking hours thinking of the edge of something. So if you ask someone who's not trained as an artist to draw something or explain something, they'll, they'll visualize the edge of it and not the underlying information that we're trying to get to. That's why it's so hard to learn this stuff, is it's counterintuitive. You're going to spend 23 hours a day doing type sight, you're going to spend one hour thinking of being an artist. It doesn't balance out. It's a habit that's hard to break. So what we had that in early sculpture is the bar relief uh, pharaohs were like this, and this did this. And then there are sculpted pharaohs that were full sculptures. They were designed to be seen front on. They were oftentimes set in alcoves, or they were sculpted in the rock, and they were face forward. They were sitting on the throne, on the Isis throne, Horus was, or whatever it was. Very front, very formal, very realistic, stylized, but very realistic. But they had a one-dimensional pose. They were meant to be seen from this. The early Greek sculpture is called Kyros, and there are these young boys, these athletes that are sculpted, freestanding sculptures, and they're standing like this, with very few variations of it. And they're looking straight ahead, and they're meant to be seen this way. That's one-dimensional sculpture. The form itself is sculpted in the round, but the position is meant to be seen front on, one-dimensional. Now, if you look at the uh, Greek sculpture that we uh, think of and generally love so much, the Aphrodites and the Bacchuses and Apollos, you'll have Aphrodite or Apollo, they'll have done this. And they will have taken this weight, and rather than making it symmetrical and balanced, they will make it asymmetrical. And as soon as you get asymmetry, asymmetry, you get the watery movement now. So our bodies are designed on water, but it took them quite a while. It took them to like 350 BC or so before the poses were designed on water. As soon as you do this, you get that watery design. You get contrapposto opposing positions in the pose because one thing's working at a different level than the other. One's working hard and the other's relaxing. As soon as you do that, you throw asymmetry in it, Everything else has to adjust the balance. Because if it just does that, it'll start to fall over. So it's got to balance out. So if I get the this supporting, this hip gets higher, this gets lower, usually what will happen is this shoulder will get higher, this will get lower, and then Bacchus will be like this, or it'll be holding some grapes, or a little chair, or something like that. So these can break out and do their own thing. But the overall movement of the pose and the support system will be based now on this opposition. This is working, so what happens? We get a stretch now here, bold. And then where does that stretch in? Ends at a bind. And then what happens? It stretch in the end. And you'll find the interesting thing about this lottery idea is every stretch will end at a pinch. It might be a really lazy pinch. Here's a stretch, here's a pinch. Here's a stretch, here's a pinch. Or it might be a real dynamic pinch. But we'll get every stretch ending in a pinch, every pinch begins a new stretch. And so if we take our beanbag idea with our stretch and our pinch and add another beanbag, and a beanbag that's going to balance, now this pinch begins a new stretch, and this stretch ends in a pinch, and that pinch will begin a new stretch, and this stretch ends in a pinch. It will go on and on and on, and that's the body action of the spine. So that's what the Greeks did for us. They did this. And what it did is it created that stretch and pinch movement. And you got what was Rodin called the classic curve. The classic curve is you can get all or most of the figure as a simple silhouette in one lazy curve. Now this might be doing this, and this might be doing this, but from foot all the way up here, this all kind of groups, but all or most of the forms will sweep together. And then on this side, will start to bind up. And the interesting thing about this is because the body is built on this curved spine, it's not curved this way, is it? Stiff and straight that way. It's only curved this way. 
And that's why the kilos were one dimensional, because this way they were stiff and lifeless. They were designed off a real figure, so if we got to see them this way, we weren't meant to see them that way, we could see the movement, the stretch of the belly, the pinch of the hip. So it was designed this way. But as soon as you do this, now what happens? We get not only a stretch and pinch in the spine, we get a stretch and a pinch this way too. So now it's stretching and pinching in every silhouetted position. So no matter which way I turn, we get that classic curve moving all or most of the body in one sweeping line from every direction. And so that was a sculpture that was meant to see in the round. So instead of looking at it mainly frontally like the early uh, Greeks and the Egyptians, these, the uh, Greek sculptures were meant to be walked around, to be seen. You see it from this, it'll have the same fluid, graceful lifeline from every direction because of the asymmetry that sets up the wave action. So here we only get asymmetry in the profile moved position, but as soon as we move into the front view, we've lost it. Okay. Now from every view, it's clear. And now we can create all sorts of variations of that, the discus, so that gave us a two-dimensional sculpture in terms of position. The form of the sculpture is three-dimensional, but the pose itself is two-dimensional and not three-dimensional. I'll explain why in a second. One-dimensional, stiff axis, not meant to be seen in silhouette, but just from one direction. Contrapost go this way. Now we can see it in the round. But look what happens from heel to foot. It's still on a vertical axis. It? It's still on the flat picture plane. If I want my drawing to have true three dimension, I've got to push the form into the picture plane or pull it out from. I'm going to give the illusion going into the paper. Now, any specific form will do that. You, know, you might do this and it'll come forward. But the whole pose did. The whole pose was a vertical line, the ear over the heel, balancing out. And it took Michelangelo to break that idea. What he did is he took, and they were all thinking like sculptors, not like painters, because they had to balance out all this clay or bronze so it didn't break off. So the Greeks figured, if I do this, it's going to crack at the heels and fall down. It's got to be stable. Oftentimes they'd put a little stump down here, or a couple little cherubs clinging to it, or Aphrodite's dress filling out, so you had a nice, wide, stable base, but they're still afraid that if they did this kind of stuff, it'll break out. But Michelangelo did that. What he did is he did these victory uh, sculptures where he had a fallen captive who was usually like this, kneeling down, and the victor put his knee on the guy's back, and now we had a nice, wide base, and now Michelangelo did this. And he had it, you know, we had this, and we also, like I said, we also had this twist in the Greeks, but now he did it this way. Now what's happening? Now we're getting the Kyros with a one-dimensional stretch, one-dimensional contrapposto this way. The Greeks now are two-dimensional because it can build, it can bend in the picture plane. Stretch on the paper, pinch on the paper, stretch on the paper, pinch on the paper, and now Michelangelo pulled it out this way. So now we have a ribbon of form twisting out towards us or back into us. And you'll see that now, third dimension. Now the whole pose, the head is not over this, it's breaking out over it, or it can be falling back away from it. The whole pose is breaking the picture plane. So stiff and formal only a curve going this way. Contrapposto, now we have the rotation of the curve going this way. Michelangelo, now it's third. So we have uh, facing, that was the Kuros. We have leaning, that was the Greek. And we had tilting, that was Michelangelo, building on the last two. And so now it goes out like that. So look at Michelangelo's last judgment paintings. Look at his victory sculptures and you'll see this movement out. Now the odd thing about it is the painters learned their poses from the sculptors in the Renaissance. They learned them from the, the Greek and Roman sculpture that they dug up. And so they weren't really thinking like painters. Painters, there's no structural problem in painting. You can paint anything you want. 
it will be fine. If they never made that thing that seems so obvious to us, they never made, made that leap. Michelangelo was the one who did it. And that's why, among other reasons, he was considered the greatest artist of his time, and some people think still the greatest artist, because he made that intuitive leap of first breaking the idea completely, but also breaking the structure so it could still stay in sculpture, still stay three-dimensional with weight and engineering problems involved. And they didn't have all the high density steel that we have now to fight some of these things. But um, had that, but he did these paintings. So what Titian, Raphael, and the great great artists, where they get their poses? They ripped them off from the Greek bar reliefs. They'd see something bar relief that was dug up and they'll see, see some of the climbing woman in a nice classic curve where most of her body sags into the pillow and they petition and use that as his Venus of Rubino or something. And then Michelangelo all of a sudden comes up with new poses. And just think about it. If we're going to make this beautiful, graceful line of a figure and yet make it stable, make it contrapposto, that's a lot of limitations. How many poses can you do before you get in trouble with that, those criteria? Not very many. There's not too many variations of that. You can do this kind of thing, but the overall design is very limited. But as soon as you do this, now you can have Frank Frazetta's where the monsters are jumping out of the page at you, and you can have Tieplos where they're, the horse is jumping through the sky over the top of us. You can have all these variations once you break that third plane. It took Michelangelo to do that, and that's why you'll hear the stories of Raphael stealing Michelangelo poses. He'd sneak into the Sistine Chapel at night with his friends, check out the poses they did end up in his paintings the next month in the private chambers of the Pope. He was ripping them off. And it, it was accepted at that time. It was a great idea. We'll use the great idea. It was not considered plagiarism. Everybody knew that Titian and Raphael were ripping off the, the Greeks and then uh, they were ripping off Michelangelo. It was just part of the process. It was public domain, new idea, we're all the music. Raphael was great because he used those ideas better than anybody else did. He combined those separate ideas and unified them into one painting better than most people. But those are the three, the three stages in art history and the three dimensions to the development of true contrapposto. This is contrapposto, this is contrapposto, and this is contrapposto. Facing, leaning, and tilting. Three positions of space, three dimensions. The design then can be developed on all three of those dimensions. And those are the possibilities you can put. So let's do our last uh, set and a half. Let's just do five fives. Now, when we say compos composition, that's a, uh, a multifaceted term. We could break it simply into the total composition. That's the values, that three value idea that we use to work with. We could do the color composition. That's on top of those values, the color key, the dominant colors, the uh, light source, the dominant, negative night scene, or it's all going to key off the other, that stuff we're talking about. And then there's a third one, the drawn composition, we'll call it. And that's the shape and the gesture. It's like the drawing, those of you, of you who have me in the morning, we talk about two ideas, gesture and structure. The gesture is the fluid lifeline, how the forms connect gracefully in a lively manner. We call that the gesture. How we flow from one isolated problem to the next. It integrates the parts. We break it into pieces. We break the story into 12 chapters. The 12 chapters have to merge into one story. And so how we take the separated elements 
and really in some ways arbitrarily separate. We decide to end it here, we decide to end it there, and yet keep it going. We decide to end it at the joints on the body oftentimes, but it doesn't end at the joints. The muscles, the blood vessels, the electrical impulses all pass through that joint like it wasn't even there. It's an arbitrary separation. So how do we break it into pieces, break it into simple parts, simple structures, so that it's manageable, simple chapters, separate characters in our story, separate steps in our dance, separate notes in our song. How do we separate it down into manageable parts and yet integrate it back into a complete whole? It's the completion of that integrating and unifying process of art. Art is making it all grouped together into one thing. Art is the unifying idea. It's the oneness of the one kind of a you know, new age world. It's how you make all the pieces, all the muscles into one figure, all the peaches into one still life. The artist's real problem is integrating all this stuff. I got eight colors on my palette. How do I take all that different colored mud and make it one page? That's the problem. So we can integrate it in value. We can integrate it in color. We can integrate it in the drawing. Notice by integrating, the way we near humans usually do is by reducing our choices down. I'm only going to have three colors. I'm going to key the whole painting off one or two colors. I'm going to break all the mini muscles of the forearm into one shape and one gesture. When you reduce your choices, it's easier to work with. It's more manageable. But also, it's more creative in a way. Because by reducing your choices, you're forced to come up with new solutions. New, new ways to do it. So I find most artists limit themselves in subject matter, in palette, uh, in some way, in style in some way, and that's what forces creativity. If everybody's doing tubes for arms, how can I do it in a fresh way? Because frankly, most everything's been done already in drawing, especially for new realistic drawing. But how can I make it that much different so it's interesting? So the drawing composition is gesture, how the parts connect or flow together or break apart, how do they connect? and the parts themselves, how they sit in space, the pieces in position or perspective. Those are the two elements. And if you study drawing, you get to deal with those ideas. We flow from upper arm to forearm, from forearm to a hand. The thenar eminence is a bunch of muscle, but it's one aid. The knuckles is one box. The forearm is, or the finger is one tooth. So we can learn to integrate these things and by making it simpler, get more control of it. But the interesting thing about this is the theory of figure applies not just to the all the separate elements of a figure, but all the separate figures in a composition. So if you have six, uh, six bodies, six people in your painting, you can put them in the same structural and gestural theories that you can their thumb or their arm or their torso. So you can integrate a figure into a simpler idea. You can integrate several figures. The composition is taking the same ideas of integrating uh, complex things into simpler, more manageable pieces and applying it on a greater scale. And all this comes just from the Greeks. What the Greeks did is they started to observe nature systematically. That's where we got the beginnings of our scientific method, the beginning of science, of studying biology, the nature channels based on us interested in how animals behave, study horticulture, math, music, all that stuff really systematically began in terms of the way we think of it with the Greeks. And what they did is they looked at nature and they said, well, Nature, we can take the sky and we can break it into a bunch of stars. We can take the tree and break it into roots and trunks and limbs and vegetation. And by taking them and breaking them into smaller parts, analyzing those smaller parts, we can learn more about that, that thing. And then what we have to do is take those separate things, put them back together. So we can break it into manageable pieces, 
I'll study the uh, lion, you study the tiger, he'll study the bear, and then we'll come together and we'll figure out the ecosystem. Figure out how all those animals work together to, in, a, in some kind of whole. So, by breaking it into pieces, manageable pieces, studying it, and then bringing it back into the system, comparing that piece to the system, you can scientifically, rationally, which is the big word for the Greek studies, rationally understand things. And that's what we're going to use for composition. So that applies to anything in nature, and it applies to anything in art for the most part. Very few artists don't deal with this in some way. Picasso will, most every artist will deal with it. A few minimal artists will, but for the most part, abstract expressionists, cubists, they all deal with these same problems of breaking the, the painting or the idea into separate pieces, and how you put them back together. If I'm a cubist, I'll start doing this. I'll just put them together weird. But it's the same idea. So what we're going to find then in drawn composition, we can have these ideas in it too, but we're going to break it into these simple ideas. So we're going to see how the parts uh, flow together off straight lines or alignments and curved lines and alignments. And we're going to see how the separate objects or pieces can be broken into bigger shapes. So we're going to find the isolated objects grouping into bigger shapes and the isolated objects group, uh, grouping into bigger alignments, bigger rhythms. That's going to be the basis of what we do, because that's the basis of what we do when we study the figure. So I've got a finger with three pieces. But they have to line into one curve, or they line up into one string, or they break into three corners. And then each part has its own shape, it's called each tubes. So that's going to be how we work from it. So we're going to start on that next break. I want to give you one uh, definition of composition in general first. When we say composition, What we're really saying is all the tools of design, you know, making things different in size so it doesn't get monotonous, stay away from tangents, stay away from uh, uh, tacky colors, or too, colors that are too sweet, or all that, or things that are getting too complicated. All the basic things you learn in design of 101, where you learn to be tasteful, or you learn not to jar the audience when they look at the board and move into it. All those things we're really trying to go through as many as we can here. Plus a concept. So one of the um, things that's happened over the last 70, 80, 100 years is composition and design have grown to be the same thing and they're not the same thing. Tastefully decorating a room is designed. Tastefully arranging the shapes on a canvas as a design. Composition is more than that. It's having a specific goal in mind, a specific concept. And all of the design tools are just that. They're just tools to explain your idea. And I always think of stories when you think of art. Same way with a story. I have special effects. I have the actors with their emotions. I have the dialogue. I have lighting. I have staging. All those things are there not just to be pretty, <clears throat> but to better tell the story. If I've got a scary scene, lightning, the lighting will go black and white, black and white. The emotions will be high. They think everything's absolutely fine in there and start raving terror from boredom to, to mania kind of thing, extremes. The house will be an old, decrepit house that creeps. It's not well put together. You'll pick out all of the tools of creating a pretty picture, but they will be designed to create a certain story, to tell a certain story or give a certain emotion to the audience. The better you use all those ancillary tools, the better the written words come to life. And that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that whatever our main idea is, 
all of these are just tools to better explain it. It's not just about making it pretty, making it aesthetically pleasing. That's one aspect to it. It has to also be more descriptive. It has to help us understand what you're saying. And we'll look at some examples if you go on to see, see that. But if we can be inventive in how we put all these things together, and there's going to be a whole string of uh, things that will work under this general heading, every one we use becomes a prop or a tool to explain our concept. So it's important you know what your concept is when you begin. In a class like this, it's hard to have some deep philosophical statement out of a model on the stage. But what you can do is try and evoke an emotion or a general mood. I want to create an upbeat, happy feeling. How do I put values, colors, shapes, and gestures? It all suggests that. Should I have her fingers kind of zigzaggy? Yeah, that's too much. Should I make the color, the values really dark and super moody? Yeah, that's a little scary. Just as soon as you start, start with a concept, certain things start to suggest themselves. And then you can go with it or you can go against the grain. But um, let's stop there with that in mind. We've got to have a concept, an idea behind the tools of the trade. Some of the traditional uh, theories and methods, and then I'm going to show you kind of a, a way you can go through basic picture making choices. Now, what we'll find is that the picture, whatever it is, and however many elements are in there, the overall design or composition is going to be based on the shape or shapes, and we're going to call the gesture the alignment of the shapes. So it's a piece of different term you want. But what we'll find is quite often the shapes will group into the same kind of shapes that we get as choices for drawing the figure. You're going to find boxes and triangles and circles. And notice that they're two dimensional versions of um, wedges and tubes, cones and spheres and egg shapes. So when we're doing the figure, we might use an egg for the head. Well, in a Raphael painting, you might still use an egg for the head, but the whole figure might be grouped into some other shape. And we'll see these shapes. This is probably the most commonly used shape because that's probably the most commonly used shape or the most commonly seen shape in the figure itself. You want to stand there for a while and you do. You get into a stable position. You get a wide base and you get a narrow top. So if I sit like this, I'm going to shake that. So when you look at a figure, quite often you'll see that they can stand here and do some kind of climb, or they can sit here. And if they're planning to be there for a while, see these shapes develop and the more stable the shape the longer they can stay. Let's take that same shape and let's reverse it. Now I can't hold it long. I'm not as stable. All over if I get on all fours 
might be a box shape. If I fall up in a fetal position on the ground, it might be a ball shape. You'll tend to see these, and then since they're organic, you'll find that each side of it has a certain uh, personality to it. You can find some curves, some straight, some bulky, some bindy, those kind of things. This might be flat, or it might be going back into perspective. Those kind of things. But you'll see that the, the overall painting, the piece of art, will have some or all of its pieces arranged in this high this greater structure. It organizes it. Let's look at a couple of examples. So I take e almost any portrait you'll ever see, and you'll find that. But look at almost every Madonna and child you'll ever see, you'll see the same thing. Can you see what shape this is? It's a triangle. Now that's the design choice. It made it a more pleasing, cohesive whole. all the separate things and broke it nicely into one structure. What you'll find is that these shapes themselves have a certain personality to them. If you want to show stability, a triangle is a good way to do it. If you got a uh, guy guarding the bar, the bouncer at the bar, how does he stand when people come in? He stands like this. No, he stands in a powerful position to let you know you don't want any trouble. They stand like that, guard the gate. Wide stance, puff out chest, head up, so he can get as tall and as wide, as big as he can. Show stability and strength. We'll, um, we'll also find that there's a conceptual basis to this. If you see a triangle in almost any culture, it'll usually have something to do with God or with spirituality. Because what uh, every culture has come to in some way or another is that there's two sides of life. There's male and female, there's day and night, there's good and evil, there's life and death, on and on and on and on, and on other than the minimum. Things tend to get broken into this and that, into two different things, me and you. And then there's a connection of the two, and that's the mystery. When two people meet, the falling in love, the liking or the disliking, that's the mystery. That's what you can't quite get. So when we are alive, we're alive, and we're dead, we're dead. How do we get from one to the other? How do I breathe and be conscious and go to that point where I'm not? If I've got the God and I've got the messenger of God, I must have a connection of messenger to message. So Father, Son, Holy Ghost, the Trinity, you have Father, which is God, Son's the messenger, the Holy Ghost is the spirit or the message or the connection. That's what connects one to the other, that's to that. So the Trinity becomes, the three becomes specific in, uh, in uh, Christianity, but it's specific in every single religion. If you look at Buddhism, you'll get three masks oftentimes. So there'll be a mask looking this way, a mask looking that way, that'll be male, female, female yin-yang, and then there'll be a mask in between with the eyes closed. That's the relationship of the two. In fact, in the yin and yang symbol, you get this idea, this kind of fish sign. And then you get this one's black with a white eye, and this is white with a black eye. We have the two opposites, but they're not completely disconnected. There's a relationship between them. a little bit of ones and the other, a little bit of females and the male, a little bit of males and the female. The connection is that third 
side. So three has become really the magical number in almost any age. And we'll find if we wanted to compose off one other thing, we'd compose off numbers, numerology, because that, that's much less important nowadays. But it's uh, that in every culture became important. One was usually God. Two was the duality of life. Three was uh, the duality of life connected back to the spiritual, the physical, back to the metaphysical. Four was usually man or earth, the four corners of the world, the four seasons, four ages of man, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, circle was usually God or perfection, the halo, that's the circle in perspective. That's it. when you get married, you get your ring on. It's never beginning, never ending, so it's immortal. It, uh, means immortality, and it's perfection. If you read Plato, uh, you find that the soul is a circle because it's perfect, and that's why the church took so long to accept elliptical orbits. It's just, what, 70 years ago or something, actually accepted Copernicus and Galileo as uh, ideas that there was elliptical orbits, because an ellipse is imperfect, and God would not do something that's imperfect, so it had to be circles. So you have the heliocentric, Sun was accepted, but then the planets must have been circles. So, um, I've gotten five. Right? Five is uh, oftentimes man, actually, because we have five points to us, five senses, those kind of things. And then uh, everything else becomes multiple of these. Four, he did, or I mean, six uh, is three times two, or three plus three. Nine is a big one because that's three times three. That's a perfect number. Usually, that's the magical number of numbers because it's God squared. And if you take nine, it's magical because nine times anything becomes nine. Nine times 1 is 9, 9 times 2 is 18, 8 plus 1, you always reduce it down in these mystical things, becomes 9. 63, which is a root of 9, 6 plus 3 is 9. 72, 7 plus 2, 54, 45, they are, they're always 9. And that's a great sign for this mysterious being behind everything. Behind everything, he's always there. And that's kind of the so nine is magical. Uh, Twelve and seven are both basically the same thing. Three plus four, this is the metaphysical, this is the physical. When you add metaphysical and physical or multiplying, you get seven and twelve. Um, seven levels of uh, heaven and Dante, the twelve apostles, the twelve signs of the zodiac, all those. And then thirteen. For most of the time, 13 was actually lucky uh, because you've got these, and then Christ would be the 13. Uh, in the tarot cards, I think the fool is the 13. He's the one that's above, who roams the world freely and just has a good time. And he understands everything and is, is not weighed down by the difficulties of life. So 13 is usually breaking the cycle, becoming a prophet, or becoming above all the system being able to control and break the rules. Um, so the, anyway, those are your, the numerological ideas. So a number becomes important. So when you see these shapes, oftentimes they're number-based too. And so that Raphael we looked at, we had the Madonna and child, Madonna, and then we had Christ and we had John the Baptist, three little heads there. And we had the Christian Trinity, we had motherhood. Now let's just think of this conception. We've got motherhood. What's more comforting than a mother holding her child or children, supporting them? She's in this big, billowy robe, so she's nice and wide and stable. We want, we have a stable idea of mother and child, comforting, uh, not scary, but stable and comforting idea. So we want a nice, stable shape. But also, we've got the Christian mother and the, uh, the Son of God. So we have this whole metaphysical idea. 
so that's super stable. Stable story. It's stable mostly, but stable it's going to save your soul. It's really stable. So that would be the perfect image to do it. And then quite often what you'll see at this stage of the game is lots of eggs. All the little baby shapes are eggs, and Madonna's face is an egg. And egg is what? Egg is birth. So birth, life, and that kind of stuff. And so you'll find, uh, find that there's two shapes going on in most Madonna and child imagery. The egg shape for birth and the uh, Triangle for uh, Christian Trinity and so And you'll see many of the altar pieces this a circle on top of a square or sometimes on top of a rectangle. And like uh, Titian's Assumption of the Virgin. Just so you know, once you understand these rules, you can go against the grain. Notice that the triangle also is an arrow that points up to God. Well, actually, let me show you the, I'll dig out the actual paintings. I'll show you a way of playing with these ideas so it's not so typical on the next break. So let's stop there and do our next set. But after, this is common knowledge. It's <laughs> like, you start reading a poem about a road, probably the long poem. It's pretty common knowledge. And so this was a, uh, thank you, this was a um, visual set of tools that everybody was common with. And so the artist had access to it. He put up a cross, put up a Star of David, those kind of things. Most people would get a sense of it other than just a geometry or an aesthetic idea. And so they had these incorporated in them. And the theory was, even if they didn't, it was, it was uh, sublimely there. They would pick it up on some level. And that's kind of the theory they said. Uh, color also has symbolism. And it will vary somewhat from society to society. Some societies, green will be rot, decay, death. Others, it will be renewal, growth, potentiality. It depends. Yellow might mean sickness, or yellow might be sunshine and daylight and purity in life. Uh, gold tends to be immortality because it doesn't rust. Silver and the moon usually associated with those kind of things. Um, blue is usually the water of the sky, so it's mystery. It's depth and mystery. Um, purple, or let's do red. Red is usually either blood, uh, as in uh, Violence or blood is in passion, lust, life, or blood, uh, red, the passion, the Christian is red for that. If you put red and blue together, light and the mystery, you get royalty. Because kings and queens in the early cultures were ordained by the gods. The Pharaoh was the god on earth, and so the kings kept their power, uh, partly by working with them the idea that they were God's chosen. And so you've got the mystery of God in the blue sky above, and you got life's power, life's blood. Put that together, you got the king of the purple rose. So there's all those kind of things. Now, admittedly, at this in this day of age, they have fairly weak power for us. They're fun to know. They're mainly at this point for you to illustrate the idea that these things are tools that you can create. So the bad news is, nowadays, as opposed to back then, things change every five, six years. Art movements, there's really no art movements anymore at all, for the most part, but you watch the history of art movements, the Egyptian art movement lasted two to 2,500 years before there was any significant change at all. It was a little blip for a while, and then it went back to the same old thing for another five or years or so. So for three or 4,000 years, 
it never changed. We don't even hardly know any of the artists, a couple of them we know by a lot. But for the most part, it was one style. It was a house style that lasted 3,000 years or so. And then as you move on, society will start moving quicker and quicker and quicker. And pretty soon it will last just a couple hundred years, then a few decades, then it'll keep moving on. The uh, high renaissance lasted 50, 60, 70 years, and you had the Baroque, and you had Rococo, then you had the Romantic movement, then you had neoclassicism, then you had uh, Depressionism. It just, and everything started to go quicker and quicker, correct? And the most impressionism, Dadaism, Futurism, politics and stuff. And then pretty soon, it was just a year or two or three or four that they last, then they were gone. So it sped up. And so what we have now is a society that was so quick, these icons don't have a lot of meaning. If we do the triangle, they're not going to get that this is a, a prayer shape to God. And if they do, it will be a purely art historical idea, it won't have any emotional impact on it. So that's the bad news. But the good news is, if you can keep your audience for a while, you can reinvent, re, uh, reinvest it with power, or come up with your, your own metaphors for shape. And that's what they've been doing in movies. You can do that if you have a show, or especially a series of shows, you can work on an idea long enough, they'll get the idea. And what they do is they end up stepping into the world you've created, and if you can suck them in long enough and powerfully enough, they'll take on, uh, they'll accept the message you have. And that's why Star Wars movies and Matrix, where they have these underlying messages, people get into them and they think there's a force and there's going to be a Yoda out there and they buy into that stuff. If not purely intellectually, emotionally. If they don't believe there's one, they wish there's one. And those are the powers of myth and metaphor. So if we look at uh, film for a second, we'll find that film does exactly the same thing. In fact, film's great to look at because we're usually, as a culture, a lot more familiar with the mechanics of film than we are with painting. We don't spend that much time. If you go to a, a show that you like the artist for, if you come here and you like the work, how long did you actually spend, even if you absolutely love the painting on the wall, how long did you actually spend looking at any of these come here week after week, at best, I got you for a couple of minutes. If you come back four or five weeks in a row, maybe I got you for 10 minutes. If you like it so much you want to sketch it in your book, maybe 15 minutes. But if I can get you into a movie, two hours. If I can get you into a novel, two to six hours, I can hold you for a long time. They're more powerful mediums in that sense. But film is interesting because it took all the tools of picture making and painters and applied it to film, and all they did is add an edit. It's the only new form that goes into that. Everything else is the same. And I use the same ideas that we're using here. If you look at Alien, the movie Alien, and uh, the second one, Aliens, what was uh, the shape that they used the most in Alien? Okay. Okay. Now, what did an egg mean for Raphael? Mother, her mother was used for the head, used for a lot of other things, but it, it meant motherhood, life, birth. Now, what was the concept of those little nasty creatures? They had birth, didn't they? But it was a horrific birth. And they stayed in these little eggs until you woke them up and they jump on your face. <laughs> but the, it was a horrific birth. And what was the second movie about? The mother alien was trying to breed its young. Sigourney Weaver had adopted this little uh, orphan child. It was two mothers fighting to protect their young. It was about motherhood again. Those, both those pictures were motherhood, motherhood and birth. And if you go through them, you'll find egg is in there. And also, the very first scene, when you wake up in the ship, what color is the ship painted? White. I didn't see it, I thought. <laughs> well, go rid it tonight. <laughs> I won't sleep. <laughs> it was painted white. They got out of their, their stasis, they were in suspended animation, they got out of it in these diapers. They had these white little diapers on. They were on this round console that was in perspective shape again. The ship's computer's name was Mother. The android that was in there had milk for blood. 
white milk, eggs for birth, diapers for baby, babies, mothers for shifts, everything they could do they packed in that was any kind of relationship to mother, birth, egg, life. Exactly what Raphael did, but for completely different reasons. So films, when they're smart, will take shapes and colors and numbers even. Although this is the weakest of the links usually. And use them not as design, not to be pretty, but to help tell the story. If you think of uh, uh, Fatal Attraction, I'm giving all these horrific films. <laughs> Fatal her Attraction, they met in the rain. She tries to kill him with a kitchen knife out of the sink. She goes into the bathroom, slits her wrist. She parboils her buddy and she dies in the bathtub. Everything that bad happened in that movie happened with water. Now water is usually life, but they use water as a metaphor for death. And so they use that in the film as a, a visual tool. One other nasty movie that's bad, Godfather. The opening scene, that whole, all, all three of those films, the idea of the film is family. It's literally the family, it's a dad with his children, but it's also the mafia family, so it's family of two senses. But they, the opening scene there, they have them lit overhead. Marlon Bradley's behind his desk, lit like this, and the guy asking him to kill somebody, and his daughter's outside in the sunshine getting married. And he's in this dark, somber It's all earth tones. Every time you're in the house of the Godfather, earth tones. So the family colors are earth tone colors. And he's lit, for the moment, he's lit like a skull. He's got shadow, 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 shadow. And the whole film is, is built on the death of the family. Every decision he makes sucks his kids into it. His kids get killed. He dies. His youngest son ends up being worse than he does. Every decision they made destroyed their family. That's called a theme. When you have great art, you'll not only have the subject, Godfather, Mafia, you'll have a theme underneath it. Not just a haunted house. Aliens is a haunted house. There's a monster in the haunted ship. And he's walking around eating people. And Frankenstein or Wolfman or Dracula would happen to be alien. But the theme was birth and motherhood. So you might have a cop show, but the theme might be man's inhumanity to man, or you have to, to beat a crook, you have to get be as bad as a crook or something. You can have some underlying message that's the reason that you do the art, actually. Because remember, art, the real reason to do art, just like the real reason to have religion, is to tell us why we're alive, what our life means, how we fit in. And so if you're just talking about a love story, you're just talking about a shoot em up or a horror film, it might be a diversion, but it's not very important. As soon as you leave, you forget it. But if it talks about how to live, that you have to get in touch with the good side of the force. Whatever it is, it's going to touch not everybody, but some people will have it. So the great art has themes, and the theme is what gives you the concept. If you want to deal not with aliens, but with motherhood, mother and child relationships, and it didn't do it very well, but it, it was there, then maybe we'll come up with shapes to support that concept. And all of a sudden, decisions start being made for you. If you want to talk about how love's immortal, maybe you'll use this as a predominant color. Maybe she'll have golden hair, and they'll, they'll, they'll walk around in the sunshine or the golden beach, or whatever it is. Or maybe you'll go against the grain. And real quick, let me show you a couple of inventive ways to do this back in, uh, in paintings now. I'll tell you one, and I'll show you some others. <clears throat> There's a um, Leonardo da Vinci painting of, uh, of uh, John the Baptist. And he was a messenger. He was foretelling that God, Christ was going to come down, all that kind of stuff. And normally what you do in a portrait is you do this. It's a nice stable image. Holds things together. And you've got a naturally bigger body than a head, so it works naturally. 
plus what you have. What uh, Da Vinci did, he was the first one really to organize objects into shapes, into greater holes. He's the one who started this whole thing. And what he did is he had John the Baptist, and he had, hey, let me see if I can remember, he had a staff like this, and, uh, oh, he had a staff like this, hold like that, with a little cross in the staff. And he was standing like this, like that, and this arm went this way, and he was looking at us, and the staff did this, and the arm did this, and, the, and he went down into darkness, so he didn't see much of this. He was a reverse triangle. Now, why was he a reverse triangle? Well, we've got Madonna and Child. The message is on Earth trying to sway us. But he was telling us that the message was about to come in. Yeah. That he reversed the sequence. So pretty inventive. You know, let's make a stable image. Let's talk about how God is on Earth. Let's talk about the church as this pillar, this mountain of support. Stability, or let's invert it and say the message is coming down. In fact, if you do the Star of David, that's exactly what that symbol means. The powers of heaven facing up, or the powers of the earth looking up, the powers of heaven coming down, and they meet in perfect harmony. That's a Star of David symbol. So it's, it's heaven and earth coming together. Another one is Rubens. He has a trying to find the I couldn't do it. But he's got this army of people killing these poor citizens, these soldiers killing these poor citizens. And it's literally a wave, not literally a wave, it's shaped into a wave of destruction. It's washing over the city, killing these people. And it, as soon as you do that, it creates this beautiful gesture to this horrific scene. It has a thematic meaning, a wave of destruction. It's a, Metaphor, and you can start reading into it. Well, the wave of destruction washes over everything indiscriminately, wipes it out, but also a wave washes back on itself. So these guys are going to get their comeuppance later on. They washed over these people, and they're going to get washed over later. It's a historical return, I think. It gives you, uh, it gives more depth as well as just aesthetic unity. It gives more depth to the idea. A couple of quick ones here. Or well, let's uh, I tell you what, let's do our last set and I'll give you these on the next break and we'll finish it up on the, on the next week too, but I'll give you one more. And that becomes a real concept. So we have a subject, but in real art, the subject is just the excuse to talk about something beautiful. In religion, you oftentimes have a sacrifice. Somebody got killed. But the actual message is something much more powerful, much more spiritual. So that's what we're really uh, interested in as the audience, is seeing in art some universal theme, some life theme that tells us about our life. That uh, when we die, we go to heaven. That when you get married, you two become one. Some idea that gives you some some purpose in life, some goal, some perspective on life. It's not about trying to catch the cat with the traffic light and tor tor turns yellow. There's something more to it than, than that rat race. That's what people are looking for. If you can give them art that's just escapist, it's just Disneyland, it's just Indiana Jones, where you just go for a couple hours, you just have fun. You look at that painting and you just get a smile on your face, that's absolutely great, that's wonderful. But that's not our true vocation, it's not its highest calling. Its highest calling is to get you to that next level where your life means something. It's not just me trying to get a pension plan together, trying to pay the rent, trying to uh, have a support system in case I get sick. There's something more to life than that. That's what our religion, philosophy, hits at. And that's done through the theme. So if we think of movies and stories, there's a plot. And then in the really good ones, there's a theme. And it may be something you can really pin down. The you know, death of a family, that's a Godfather series. Or it might be something that's just vaguer. that just has this sense that you know there's something there. And it, 
just gives you a feeling. One way to tell, if you come out of the movie and you, if you feel like, I wish I had acted that way in that situation, when you think about the hero, it was probably a good movie that had something powerful in it. It gave you a life lesson. So we have all these tools to do that then. All these different ideas. And so um, let's look at a couple more paintings, and then we'll go into this again next week too. Titian is absolutely great for this. And let's look at a simple one. This is a dark one, of course. And this is just the entombment of Christ. They're carrying off the dead body, and they're going to put him in his tomb. And look at what's happening. Just on the simplest level here, we got all these figures either mourning or holding the body and carrying it off to the it's very unpleasant. But look at how he's just sagging here. He's just limp with gravity. He's a hammock. We're just carrying him off. There's no life in him. So just the design of his body suggests lifeless. Just the design. Now it's a beautiful shape. We get this kind of cresting of waves, yeah. Let's well, see. Well, there's a couple reasons you can do that. One, if you want it not to be about a personality, not to be about um, a per uh, somebody you might run into on the street, it makes it more universal. You can hide that. It's also more dramatic because it gives. Yeah, he's, his, his soul's gone. It's just the husk here. He's not a personality anymore. So not only is it uh, Joe Schmidt down in the block of the butcher's station, we know it's not, you know, if it's him, we kind of say, well, that's not Brian, that's Joe. I know Joe, he plays beer, plays cool. Kind of takes you out of that touchy feeling moment. But also, in terms of what this body is, it's not alive at all. There isn't a personality. Personalities to the face of the eyes. So if we want to hide that, um, the idea that it might be somebody, it can make it, now it might be you. That could be your body, that could be anybody's body. It makes it a way of connecting if it's not a specific character. So oftentimes they'll do that. But also it can just be a design tool where you, we don't want you to look here just in terms of rhythm. We want you to look here. Yeah. And your head would stop it. It could. Yeah. You know, you might be able to tie into that, but that would be another reason. But look at look at the drama. Look what is accented. The hands that are being held. This one's held up, and you just.